Hi, this is Tim Hobbs, Director of the Dartington Service Design Lab. Welcome to this recording of the 2018 Lab Lecture, delivered on September the 19th in Edinburgh by our long-standing collaborator, Professor Peter Hovland from the Social System Design Lab in St Louis. The theme of this lecture is systems thinking applied to children's services. Systems thinking and system change are not new concepts or paradigms but are currently enjoying somewhat of a renaissance. Systems thinking is pretty central to a lot of our work at Dartington, as well as to our generous co-sponsors of this event, Save the Children UK and the UK chapter of the System Dynamics Society. As such, we thought it'd be useful to bring together those that are interested in the area with Peter as one of the world's leading experts on the subject. In this 40 minute lecture, you will hear Peter Hovband outlining some key concepts of system thinking complexity and how children's services can stand to benefit from exploring the ideas in participatory ways. We hope you enjoy. So to set this up, what I'll talk a little bit about is sort of more the theoretical foundations of how I'm thinking about some of these issues, what goes on in service delivery systems, and then move into uh, different kinds. What is it that makes systems so hard to, to study? So some of this, if you're working in these systems, won't be new, it'll be more um, just sort of language. Um, but then move into talking more specifically about the approach that uh, Tim mentioned in terms of system dynamics and how you do this participatory uh, methods and then give some examples of how I think it applies and, and some closing thoughts and then there'll be some chance to ask some clarifying questions before we move into the panel. So I'd like to begin with this picture, which is um, Galton in 1969 was trying to define um, um, is a, a scholar, in, in a Swedish scholar, who is actually doing peace research, trying to develop an operational definition for peace, um, and realized that the typical definition of peace was too restricting, uh, thinking about peace as being just um, the absence of interpersonal violence or political violence. So, you know, there are a lot of things that impact morbidity, mortality, um, mental well, uh, people's well-being, um, poverty, um, um, the threat of violence, um, sort of the whole set of factors. And so he wanted to distinguish what he called personal violence or an event um, with what he described as this underlying uh, pattern that he, 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 coined, he called structural violence. And thinking about that as the propensity or the likelihood that one would be exposed to this. Um, and I like that distinction for, for a number of re reasons, but in particular, we often tend to focus on specific events and react to specific events. Um, when everybody in a particular group or age group or vulnerable population is actually experiencing the underlying propensity. So it may be I avoided the exposure to that particular event, but I was still exposed to that risk. And that's that risk that, that interests me and that has a continuous um, impact over time. Um, and in terms of my content area, what I like about it is his, his, his illustration was sort of spot on pointing out that um, the, the single sort of criminal incident of a domestic violence abuse event, that, that's an event, it's significant, but its larger impact is what it has on a, on a whole uh, demographic group in terms of women and children who are exposed. That's, that's the piece that he was concerned about. Um, there have been others who have written from this perspective and thinking about different dimensions of oppression and exclusion of what's happened, um, but I'll be focusing on this pattern of, of structural violence in that term. We can think about this as a dynamic problem, which is a term we'll use um, in system dynamics. So if we have the underlying propensity, then, and that's sort of the status quo in terms of the risk that's gonna happen, the goal is to find a way to sort of reduce this. So how do we get from this trajectory to something that's more desirable? And what's particularly important in the way uh, folks have defined structural violence, it's not just what we could do that's incrementally better relative to what we have been doing, it's what we could do theoretically. So you need to know what that outer limit is. If we could prevent a disease for the entire population, that's what we're going for. And so the, the question is not sort of what, what's the slight improvement or marginal improvement, but what's the really radical improvement um, in understanding what we're, what we're moving towards. So there's sort of three types of questions we might ask with that. One is, what can we prevent? Um, not just sort of an incremental improvement of what's feasible, but what actually, given our current technology understanding of an issue, is theoretically possible. And using that as the yardstick for determining our progress to addressing structural violence. The second kind of questions, and I think this is really where the systems perspective comes in, is how do we get there? How do we, how do we get from where we currently are 
to figuring out a pathway to to actually being able to make that kind of impact it's a we can see areas where we can make a series of incremental improvements and that might that's one sort of approach but what else has to change in the underlying system and the third one is how do we how do we know where we're doing is actually working that is we can have ideas there are lots of examples of where we have interventions they actually work empirically in a short-term basis sometimes they're quick fixes and we see them as that but sometimes it's actually pretty hard to see and the unintended consequences play out over much longer time horizons so it's important to be able to figure out ways that we can look we can understand what's working empirically so the systems thinking literature folks may have seen this before we often use the systems thinking iceberg metaphor and and I like this because it fits with this structural violence perspective the very top we have events so these are the specific events we observe we see some reach some sort of critical or legal threshold and we can intervene others may be below that threshold um, and then what we don't see are the underlying patterns or propensities over time so if we're thinking about structural violence it's actually it's that collective pattern that's happening um, that we have to use tools like epidemiology and estimation of risk and, and being able to tease that out in particular being able to understand how it changes over time and from a systems thinking perspective the, the behavior of the system that continuous pattern of time that propensity that's coming from some structure um, and in this case the structure uh, is is a feedback structure but there's some sort of causal structure that that characterizes the system that's producing these trends over time that in turn produces the events we observe and then we might ask where does the system structure come from um, our mental models or our values attitudes norms and so there might be things like well what is our what is our concept of a family out of professor bill lawson in philosophy who testified in congress and and we go and make this point about when you're developing policy for families you have to understand how you're thinking about what the concept of a family is and you have already made a whole set of assumptions about what that is as it's shaping policy so let's think a little bit more critically gender roles would be another example or thinking about the role that culture plays in in terms of expectations and aspirations um, and then some of the work I'll talk about in India that that can be very very locally situated what one village uh, or community might want for their children in terms of continuing on with one style of livelihood may not be the same for another so communities differentiate themselves and then when we think about uh, social needs in particular basic social needs they tend to also be heavily contextualized so there's some things that you need in, in St. Louis for example where, we're, where I live um, just to get to work and transportation is a major issue and so suddenly you get these things that might be luxuries in other settings but they actually get constructed as, as social needs when we give explanations for what what's producing the events and particularly the patterns we tend to sort of go from sort of that the upward direction of causality but the other thing to keep in, in mind is is there's also this opposite effect that these patterns are shaping our our structures or the systems our norms and values and so these are actually an iterative relationship between how the structure is shaping individuals individuals behaviors as a consequence of the structure ends up um, producing the behaviors when we think about individuals then um, so children families so forth um, one of the things that that's sort of central to a lot of the work we're doing in the lab and um, is that people have uh, not just different types of needs or different dimensions of needs um, but we could think about schooling um, income or, or um, poverty affordable um, stable housing health care for example mental health so one individual may have one profile on needs a second individual may have a second profile and then maybe a third profile and that these needs they change and they evolve over time so if you have an unmet need and it's not getting met the, your, the people will con compensate families will con compensate with that and that will create additional needs and that this way we organize services tends to sort of be uh, often fragmented organized around specific dimensions um, but the way we may set thresholds for eligibility criteria um, and the way we may focus sometimes people don't have enough of a need to get access to services and sometimes they exceed the, the thresholds that are appropriate for that service and so in case in this case you have a distribution of needs some are getting met some are not getting met by how we organize the system what this leads to is something that Matt Cooter and I have started uh, coining and talked about and a number of my colleagues work with is a long tail distribution and the idea comes from um, um, the book the long tail um, and thinking about how some companies for example like Netflix and Amazon 
have been very very successful at sort of recognizing that there is more sort of volume in the long tail versus a few blockbuster products or services and when you think about that in terms of delivering prevention services intervention services we might ask a question are there a few types of services that would get most of it sort of blockbuster services and we would capture most of the needs so if we could provide those services provide them in high quality a high portion of people would have all of their needs met and that would be that would be good or is it more of a situation where we have actually most of the needs have this sort of very long tail distribution so people have lots of hitter idiosyncratic needs different combinations and so you're trying to forget services working coordinated and more effectively whether prevention intervention around that set and that becomes a challenging problem we actually so this was sort of a conceptual framework we actually plot that out for example so this is a survey that has about 200 individuals where we're asking questions about their needs and plot out all the combinations in this case you see only a relatively small portion of people have there are only a few combinations here that have sort of even even a sizable and rest of it is sort of this long tail so so most of the most of the need is is concentrated sort of in the long tail so that's one example what also makes this complicated with respect to needs is different types of needs if we're thinking about child welfare children's services domestic violence services where you you you're trying to do something but you actually require a whole set of agencies that provide ancillary services to work effectively the challenges are they're actually producing different types of public goods and they actually have to be coordinated so we plot the pairwise combinations of needs and there's not much to sort of I'm not trying to sort of ask you to interpret that graph the main point here is to say if I'm providing housing services I just need one agency to get me into housing service and I need the single best effort on the other hand if it's something and we're talking about trauma and 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 re-victimization all I need is one provider to re-traumatize my experience and then that ruins the effort everybody else has to fix that something like finance or food for example might be the aggregate effort so number of different agencies pitching in none of them individually provide enough but together they actually provide the right right kind of resources and the problem is in part that we're providing these services to produce public goods but they're actually different types of public goods so some of the literature where people are trying to figure out how do we coordinate efforts around public goods most of that is actually looking only producing one public good like not for the creation of nuclear weapons or addressing climate change not actually addressing multiple combinations of different types of public goods so this is this is from a systems point of view this is extremely challenging we can also look at this in terms of like what kind of service delivery system would we need and how much of the needs would be met relative to the people who had the total proportion of needs so there's some more data from the original data set that I mentioned before and you see the proportion of need met aggregate need and then you see the proportion of individuals have who have their total need met and so it's really only sort of towards the end of where we actually have a lot of services being fully available that you actually get everybody's needs being met so this is just sort of one picture and this this we haven't mapped this out yet across many different communities but the the hypothesis is that this is something that actually would vary that that curve and to bring this back into the child welfare context this is some work that Patrick Fowler who's here is is working on with some of the conversations this is looking at unique service referrals for families and by their combination of distribution and you see another example of a long tail distributions so most of the most of the need most of the service combinations of services there are a few here that have sort of one combination that's a certain large number but it's a relatively small portion of the total and then we add it up so so all of this is a long way of saying that not only are systems important to understand but these systems are producing as we're sort of trying to and and varying degrees of success or failure coordinate services they actually produce in these long-term distribution long-term distributions of need that we need to address now when I think about systems there are different ways to think about systems and and different aspects of systems that can be challenging to manage so you can think about systems that are complicated I think about that as detail complexity so putting together an aircraft has lots of moving parts both in the assembly and actually the actual aircraft and this is the Boeing 787 has 2.3 million parts but most of them actually pretty they're constructed and they're designed to very high tolerances in terms of precision 
they're put together sort of very carefully sometimes there are glitches in the problems there like with simply the airbus a three eighty for example there's a point where the software was incompatible so there's a something that to be fixed but you can you can address those and when the systems fail they're actually i've i've shown this one for for a number of years and i realized i should also tell the story that if you if you lost the engine on this it's actually designed to be robust enough to fly and and land safely so anybody who has um anxiety about flying um just to say this is really really quite robust in that sense um and it's actually quite difficult to fly these planes outside of a of a performance envelope um so this is a complicated system but it's actually one we 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 use reliably can manage um fairly predictably then you have complex systems so an example of a hurricane is a complex system there you have many elements interacting uh, but now they're starting to interact in nonlinear ways we actually have have good characterization of how this is working and the mathematics of this means we can do things like predict where a hurricane will land uh, within a certain amount of time uh, but you see the confidence intervals of our predictions that begin to deteriorate with time so we we, we can't predict where her whether there will be a hurricane or when it will land make landfall like next year or even 30 days from now um, but we can use these kinds of tools to um, save lives to evacuate people um, to rate to take uh, preventive measures and this is a relevant example in particular in public health in u.s um, because a lot of the institutes and that a lot of the interest in national institute of health in cancer prevention in particular with system science approaches came when scott leshaw sort of looked at this and said how can we have tools that can predict and do disaster response preparedness but we don't have the same kinds of tools to make um, investments and in educated um, um, uh, better responses when we think about cancer prevention in particular over long term. So he wanted tools that look like this. Then you have a third kind of system that I think of as a complex adaptive system, and this really produces a lot of dynamic complexity. So my, con my main content area would be domestic violence. And the problem there is not just that you have multiple actors and individuals and different types of organizations interacting. You also have, you have rules that are being created and that people respond to those rules. So an example in the United States, we have um, mandatory arrest policies that were implemented over the 80s, 90s, uh, early 2000s. And one of the consequences of mandatory arrest policies was that people adapted the behavior and then you started seeing victims of domestic violence starting to get arrested. Um, and and that's, that's pretty characteristic of the system. If you, if you do anything in these systems, there's a response um, and that makes them quite challenging um, to work in. So there are a number of different systems approaches we might take to studying this. The, the approach I'll talk about is system dynamics. So I'll give you a brief intro of what I mean by that. There are a number of different definitions of system dynamics. The one I use and we use in the lab um, pretty strictly, I think, is by George Richardson, 2011. It's a, a system dynamics, the use of informal maps, informal models with computer simulation to uncover and understand endogenous sources of system behavior. So there are two different diagramming conventions in system dynamics. There are causal loop diagrams, which is on the left, and there are stock and flow diagrams on the right. We use both of them. They, they are just different ways of representing the same system. Um, both of these were drawn by participants in workshops. I really like, um, when Mark was talking, I really liked uh, this, this work very nicely. The one on the left was the second session that um, uh, in the Wall Community Center in St. Louis, the moms and dads were being involved in a uh, design of an early child intervention project called Raising St. Louis. This was a project that was gonna engage communities, um, um, program that was gonna engage communities uh, or individuals prenatal uh, uh, and, then, and then all the way up to school age. And uh, because of the length of time involved, and you might have multiple children and family, you might have families involved five, six, seven, ten years. So this had to be a program that was designed, not just user designed, but was meaningful. Um, and so they wanted not just the input of providers and what was gonna be an evidence-based intervention, but they wanted the input of the community members. Um, so we were asked to involve them in that. And this is the second of, of three workshops. Um, and so they didn't have any formal training system dynamics or causal mapping, but this is what one uh, team produced um, and you had some moms and dads, not of the same child of, of this particular case, um, but they had different ideas about uh, father support, what that meant. And so you had the father sort of saying there's a number of different things up here. And then the mom said, yeah, but the, we've got a different perspective on this too, what father support. And they could actually put it together in the same picture, which was pretty neat. 
and you see an example here of feedback loops so they had education increases employment and employment with them feedback and create more opportunities for education so this is a reinforcing feedback loop and this could both be working in a virtuous way so more education more income more education for children or it could be a vicious cycle that becomes part of a poverty trap there are lots of other things you can see about this but this was about 40 minutes of work the one on the right is a stock and flow diagram using slightly different conventions this is some work we did on Honduras with health care policy makers and leaders in Honduras around reducing maternal mortality and neonatal mortality so Honduras has been very successful at actually being able to reduce maternal mortality and somewhat neonatal mortality for a number of years through increased access to modern contraceptive practices but that was you can only take that so far so they were sort of worried that they were going to begin to plateau and they wanted to continue to make progress so the box is there they represent stocks or accumulations these are different stages of pregnancy and decision about whether someone's going to deliver at a hospital or whether they're going to deliver in the community they were trying to get people to deliver women to deliver in community and a number of different interventions and then the double lines here represent transitions or flows and so these are sort of a mother moving from this stock to this stock and the reason we may want to pay attention to stocks and flows is because they tell a different aspect of a system where this is primarily helping us sort of see where the feedback in the system is this is helping us understand the accumulations so the example I like to use around accumulations is is the following so this is my this is my stock of frustration with my caseworker and right now it's empty and so I I'm talking with my caseworker in my case I'm getting more and more frustrated and I give that feedback to my caseworker and the caseworker begins to modify their behavior so whatever they're doing they're doing less of now but what's happening with my stock of frustration it's still increasing right so my caseworker was responsive right my caseworker changed their behavior in response to my accumulated frustration but now my caseworker doesn't understand why I'm still frustrated okay so so that's one one issue and that 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 association the fact that the inflow of the behavior that something could be decreasing while the accumulation is increasing is very very counterintuitive we make all kinds of policy mistakes at all level around that mistake and not there's many examples I can share with that I won't go into that but that so that's one reason we want to pay attention to stocks and flows the other reason we want to pay attention to is I'm fed up with my caseworker I go to the supervisor I get a new caseworker and then I go to the next caseworker and the next caseworker says one little thing and my behavior is not proportional to that one little thing that the caseworker my behavior is a function of what has flowed in over time right so the accumulated frustration plus what flowed in that's actually the formal mathematical definition of a dynamic system so if we want to talk formally about mathematical systems of dynamic systems we can use stock and flows and actually that gets us into a very nice language of being able to build computer simulation models to figure out some of those things that are counterintuitive so the second aspect is it's not an either or you could use informal maps or you could use formal models with computer simulation is is the development of formal computer models to figure out what's going to happen in a system these could be thinking tools that can be scientific tools that can be tools used for evaluation um, they can be a sort of a proof of concept or a logic model so there's lots of different ways we can use simulation um, this is a picture of the, the work that I mentioned um, with the policymakers in Honduras this was funded by Bill Melinda Gates Foundation in American Development Bank and the Carlos Slim Foundation and government of Spain uh, for a period of time um, and it led it led the policymakers in particular to to we, we were working with them in particular and they understood this convention this is this is not a diagram that I would suggest trying to like digest to sort of understand but it has has four basic services pre uh, um, it has um, modern contraceptive practices uh, services um, prenatal care um, institutional delivery and postnatal postpartum care and supply and demand structure this is the level of the, the the detail that the policymakers were using in discussions and it was possible in part because they had developed some capability within their group of, of actors to actually not just understand that I offered them a simpler version they didn't want that they felt this one actually was they would be talking about their theories of change in this term um, in terms of this diagram 
um and with a simulation model, we can look at at least in a relative sense how different interventions and combinations that form strategies might impact reductions in this case in maternal mortality and neonatal mortality. um so this helped focus the discussion about where to make investments um in in honduras um so that's system dynamics. now what i've alluded to in both cases that and what tim mentioned is that we can do this in a participatory way. we can engage stakeholders, community members in this process and that is typically in system dynamics referred to as group model building so it's a participatory method for engaging stakeholders in model building um and there's a range of definitions of how people want to use that term. some some want to say that it's like anderson and and richardson really want to restrict the term group model building to you work with a closed group you begin with that group conceptualize the problem take it all the way to the to the implementation with a set of policy makers others like jack venix from megan will talk about it as you know if you're going to at some point you're going to have to talk to people and you're going to involve people in your modeling process so you either deal with that fact explicitly and manage it as a group process or you pretend it's not there which is not really going to get you the results that you you think that you're getting um and initially when i was sort of doing work in this system dynamics i just thought this was too hard building a computer model of a social system of domestic violence is hard why why in the world would you want to do this in a participatory way with people um that, that just seemed like a bad idea um but this is a picture that that sort of changed my mind. I was working, um, this is a Save the Children UK project actually um, in 2006 in Mongolia. And the question we were asked to sort of help them think through, my colleague Adam Yadamo from Washington University and myself, was helping them sort of understand what was the impact of a conditional uh, child money program and children being in school. We spent um, months and of sort of reviewing the literature, defining the problem as school dropout, and and thought we were all ready and then um on the first day we were there um it became they said you know what do you mean by dropout we said well here's the data we've been looking at and asking you for and going back and forth on and, and they said it's not a problem school dropout there are some kids who never register for school so they don't drop out there are other kids who who are in school and the problem is that they have a sick parent so they leave early or they have to uh, work on the street to supplement an income. So the problem is children being in and out of school. And then in a relatively quick period of time within that day, we had a large causal map. I told my colleague, we're, we're doing group model building. We're doing the thing we were very deliberately trying to avoid. Um, so my my we thought was at that point, we, we, we couldn't avoid it, we should manage it. But what became much more interesting with this example is um, the following week, they had already translated the diagram of how they were thinking about children's schooling and we're using it in a conversation with policymakers in in Mongolia to talk about what was unique about their program um and I, my thought is that's that's interesting if you can if you can introduce these visual conventions and have people talk about systems and they can leverage those in a few days to be able to describe something that they see as innovative that's definitely worth exploring um, and that's really become the, the foundations for, for what we now call community-based system dynamics. Um, from that project, we did some work um, pretty close to the same year, uh, but based off the Mongolia work with uh, Mental Health Transformation Missouri, um, where we were working with five groups of, of 50 people each, and, and really thinking about how do you rethink mental health services in Missouri. Um, that also led to some work then in India that has been sort of a major driver. This is my colleague, Gautam Yadama. Um, and, and this is a, a community member, a villager, who has participated in the morning session, but is now explaining what's going on in the community, the narrative. And uh, what Bala from FES pointed out is, you know, um, his, his comment, his reaction to this was, uh, I think they've been telling us these stories for the last 20 years. This is the first time we've actually had a way of understanding them and, and hearing them. Um, so we, we have pursued that. This is a picture from the um, Raising St. Louis project that I mentioned. This is a uh, alderman, uh, Jeffrey Boyd, who's, who's facilitating the session and actually designing this. Um, and then we've taken this further. And this is a picture from um, Changing Systems, our youth summit. We've been doing this now for four years. Um, Ali Simpson now runs this program. Uh, where we're bringing in high school students as fellows and then they design and lead um, high school students from the region in a four-day summit on, on some issue. This is looking at education equity 
and over time we were seeing students and people sort of develop this capacity so there are a couple of reasons you want to involve people one is what is really seeing the system together so there's lots of you may have people who actually see the system and pretty good understand what's going on but you're not actually sort of collectively seeing them together a second one is sharing of system insights so I might understand what's going to work in my part of the system but I don't necessarily have a way of conveying or convincing somebody else what's working third one came out of mental health transformation and dignity of risk is a term that I really liked it was a consumer of mental health services um, who came up at the end and he said um, you know I I have to be here as, as an advocate for services I'm going to be affected by whether the policies work or not um, but he really liked the causal mapping because he felt like it was the first time that the professionals the academics the policymakers actually understood the kinds of problems he was facing from a complex systems point of view but the other aspect he he, he liked about it he, he introduced the term dignity of risk which is if we if we can participate in the process then let, let's give us give us a shot to inform the policies that are going to have a direct impact on our lives that's really been sort of a cornerstone of, of what we do in the lab um, instead of asking whether or not people can do it let's let's assume that they can and figure out a way that we can involve them maybe it takes longer but let, let's just figure out the methods and the third, uh, the fourth one here is really something that's been emerging in the last couple of years. When we're doing this, like the Raising St. Louis, for example, was a design process, a user design process. It wasn't meant to be an intervention. It was meant to be the design of the intervention. But after the first session, one, one woman left saying, you know, if this is what they're going to do in this program, this is definitely going to work. So she, she was reacting to this as an intervention. We see similar things with youth in terms of, of teachers. Allie and I were just in in uh, Jennings um, High School and we were hearing stories about the way um, uh, <clears throat> the um, programs that impacted the kids and then how that they want to sort of understand this better as intervention so this is this is something where we don't have data on it it's more sort of anecdotal we have some internal evaluations so now I want to talk a little bit I've talked a little bit about what system dynamics is um, the participatory aspects let me talk a little bit about what we found and kind of where we're going and, wh and what we can do with this with respect to structural violence and, and in more broadly thinking about designing better prevention systems. One concern is that uh, doing that at a community level, we've talked about all communities are sort of different and have unique characteristics and, and this certainly um, has been a point of sort of doing this work around the world that's impressed me. But And so you might think, do we have to do this in every single community? Is there's, we have to design custom intervention services, understand issues locally all the time. Um, there's actually an interesting aspect of this as we started looking at, for example, just one example, mental health services and, and, and the stigma. Um, we have done some work, um, colleague Jean-Francois Trani, Alice Ballard, um, and Pulis and colleagues have done some work in Afghanistan, um, and currently Afghanistan, Pakistan, with uh, funded through ESRC, and then we had some work in China, and then I've done the prior work in, in uh, St. Louis around mental health. Uh, mental health transformation, when we, when we look across those settings and diagrams that emerge, they, they end up being surprisingly similar. So this is the actual diagram from Afghanistan, but it's pretty close to what we would we could describe what was going on in China around mental health, persons living with serious mental illness and, and stigma, and it, and it maps on very, very nicely to what we would see in St. Louis. Even though these are completely different cultures, service contexts, different levels of development, different availability of, of services, um, and we see a lot of that. So instead of seeing, um, there, there's heterogeneity, but there's also by being able to look across system, you begin to see the deeper structure um, that cuts across, which has benefits in the sense that no one community may be able to have a resource to see this picture or solve it on its own, but collectively, actually, we may be able to organize and gain insights that benefit all of us. Um, the second example is some work we're doing that's looking uh, more theoretically than around um, thinking about um, this initially started as a conceptual model around wellness and well-being um, and how individuals are growing we have the initial question was more a theoretical exercise and thinking about different ways that people develop resiliency and resilient versus chronic response to some sort of trauma um, and our first question was really could we how many how simple of a model could we get away with a building that could capture the same dynamics so this is very simple model we have um, a stock of wellness so, um, we have a growth loop that it, so you're, you're growing towards some sort of goal during a developmental phase um, in order to grow you also need a certain level of wellness or well-being um, if you don't have that you have stunting 
and then you have decline that's a result of insults, shocks, microaggressions and individuals in this case can develop coping skills that can also develop resilience and when we plot this so we can use these models to begin to think about what's happening under various conditions for different individuals within a population exposed to different risks so this is a way of then being able to pull apart several different to ask the question what would happen if this individual didn't experience any of these traumas or aggressions what happens if they experienced a single insult what happens if they experienced a series of microaggressions in addition to a series of insults and then what would be the impact of treatment versus prevention so here you see the nominal curve if nothing happened a base run the green the next line would be nothing happened but they received treatment anyway so you could think of this as over treatment they were doing well but they I mean they got they benefited but they didn't necessarily need treatment and then you have an individual here who experiences a shock and receives treatment here's an individual who experiences a series of microaggressions but doesn't receive treatment so in a third where they experience microaggressions and this shock and again so this person recovers back to where they would have been with respect to experiencing a series of insults but they and they could have benefited in this case from from treatment so this is just one individual when we run these types of models one of the things we see is that there's certain places where there are tipping points where for example treatment for certain durations is really going to alter to the trajectory there are other situations where for example in this type of scenario you just need treatment for the entire period in order to continue to grow and then there are cases where treatment up here benefits the individual but if you're if you have constrained resources maybe that's not the place to sort of focus on so these kinds of questions and being able to explore this is actually quite challenging without better theoretical models and developing models using system dynamics that can answer these questions at the individual population level and then how do we think about services becomes quite interesting when we think about how we allocate services across individuals and multiple individuals one of the ways we can use system dynamics is is really thinking about addressing this problem that's that's has a folks talk about as capability traps it's basically a problem where you're at an organizational level you're so busy putting out fires you can't invest any time in improving the process doing prevention going to coordinating council you're just so focused putting out fires and the problem is then if you can't do process improvement you have these process problems that are producing more defects that are keeping you in this trap you can have people who compensate individuals who say well you just got to work harder and do that until you burn out but really what you want to do is try to figure out ways that you can can work smarter that if we were working in a manufacturing facility that was producing something that had profits then we could figure out where those feedback loops in particular the feedback loop the reinforcing feedback loop that's that would be a quality improvement or a process improvement loop we could figure out where they were and we could create the incentives so that part of the profit could be shared with workers while also satisfying shareholders for example most of the systems we work that's not possible because we're not working within one organization or even under one government entity so the benefits that might appear for one organization require investments elsewhere so the trick is often in a multi-sectoral approach figuring out what is that reinforcing feedback loop that's cutting across and keeping us sort of all sort of struggling putting out fires and where would we be willing to make investments to be able to to change that trajectory so system dynamics can help us do that this is an example of a good model building workshop we did in 2012 looking at child welfare where there's sort of two reinforcing feedback loops that are identified in child welfare or child maltreatment and that that can be sort of the basis for designing interventions so the last point so I want to focus on is is really when we're thinking about these systems they're also incredibly difficult to sort of make improvements so I think instead of thinking about specific technical solutions or just coordination one of the goals is really to think about how do we create more effective learning systems and their system dynamics can be quite useful and part of learning organizations the concept is what some of the literature points out is that there is a you need enough variation across the system and what you're trying to do to be able to learn 
but variation alone doesn't mean that and at an organization or community level you're learning in order to learn what what is being learned somehow has to be shared in some sort of uniform way across the system so how do you share knowledge uniformly across the system different disciplines different stakeholders and so forth that's where the system dynamic diagrams in particular and the fact that you can translate these into more formal tools and simulation models really help this is one of my favorite diagrams this is from some high school students this is the second workshop they were looking at fights in schools they had stocks of teen pregnancies tension participation and relationships that produce drama and so they had a whole set of things up here that are happening that around relationships that produce drama and then the orange is what they're thinking of as the prevention strategy so some closing comments here I'm thinking about engaging communities really think about that as an intervention so it's I think when we started this work we were thinking about as research method or a planning method that elicits information but but pay attention to it as an intervention in particular the value that community members participation may have both in terms of tangible benefits but even more so we've seen people the intangible benefits sense of hope sense of knowing resources in their community is being quite powerful and if I said there's a systematic make mistake we've made over the years is underestimating that value and not respecting that the second is is a notion I think of a call structural empathy having and knowing others that understand the structural complexity of a situation could be quite powerful so when we do work in communities the fact that we can reflect back a story and tell a story in a reasonable way that community members respond to becomes an important concept identify and share knowledge I've talked about sometimes actually for a lot of the students initially when they get engaged in this work at the Washington University one of the common questions I get is you know you know these a lot of the people you're working with the question takes a form a lot of people you're working with their lives are actually pretty difficult they're dealing with incredibly complicated complex situations aren't you concerned that they'll feel more depressed after the session and so forth so we've asked them but I asked my students now just to ask them and the response is well sort of complexity is a fact of life and so this is another tool people have to manage and actually people end up feeling less isolated they end up feeling there is a system you know prior to that they might have said it's my fault I'm not doing better and they have others outside who can help validate and work with them and the last point I want to close here is really believing that people can learn I think if I want critical sort of a lot of the work thinking about sort of where we've been historically focused is on the technical difficulty of doing this but I've really seen some amazing examples of where people learn when given the opportunity and so that's where I want to put the hope so and this is a picture of this is actually a dance that a community did when our students asked and said this complexity we know how to deal with complexity we live that and then they showed the students this dance and they took a picture of this to answer that question so thank you I think we have time for